you can do. God, we want to hear your voice tonight. Speak to us. Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit out in fresh wind tonight. We invite you to come. Speak to us tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Well, God bless you. You may be seated. And I uh, want to give a big uh, welcome to those online. Uh, we started our Facebook Live. So thanks to everyone joining us on Facebook. We've got uh, Wes Leek bringing a message tonight called Preparation for Revival. And uh, just a couple of quick things to mention before uh, we invite Wes up to share. Uh, just wanted to thank you all for your prayers. We had an amazing outreach in Dubbo over the last weekend and uh, saw about 80 people come to know Jesus. Hallelujah. Give God the glory. So I took uh, Aaron, who's a young rapper in our church and a great uh, young preacher, and AJ, who is uh, a mighty man of God. And uh, AJ had never really shared his testimony in public before. Like he's kind of done it here at an international service and he's kind of done it at youth group a bit. And uh, we kind of thrust him up in front of the youth group and he shared his testimony and he was just so good. You know, he's got such a heart. And then he preached to the, the men on the, the Saturday night outreach and there was like 30 blokes there and he's just preaching it to them. Uh, on the Sunday morning he shared as well. Uh, so it was really good to kick him out of the nest and, and he feels like he's got a bit of a calling to preach now. So hallelujah. Got another one on the, another one to raise up. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, so it was great across the weekend and we preached at a high school on uh, Monday morning and about 50 hands went up for salvation. It was just an awesome outreach. So it was a great weekend. We did a, a Monday night street feed as well with a friend of Luke's actually, a guy named Mark Johnston uh, runs a street feed there. He's a friend of Luke's. So that was pretty cool. So we had a great night, uh, Monday night too. Uh, so it was a great weekend, but the favourite part for me was heading out to visit my 86-year-old great uncle. So his name's Gabriel, good biblical name. He's a bit of an angel. And um, he, uh, I hadn't seen him for two years because uh, my aunt, my great aunt passed away two years ago. She was a lovely Christian lady uh, at Stuart Town and she used to play the piano at the local school and the local church. And I remember it at her funeral two years ago. Uh, it was a beautiful service and as we left to go to the cemetery, we drove past the school and all 10 students were out with their hats off, just standing there in a guard of honour for my auntie Jill. It was so beautiful, you know. So uh, I had such fond memories of, of Stuart Town. So anyway, I went out to visit my, my uncle at the farm and uh, he's got a bunch of sheep and it's in the middle of nowhere in Stuart Town and gave him one of my new books and gave him a word for today devotional and asked him if he's going to church. He said he goes three times a year. Christmas, Easter, and the church anniversary. I said, oh, that's good, that's good, you know. And I said, have you been praying? And he said, oh, oh, no, no. I said, okay, well, you know, as a pastor, it's my greatest encouragement to people to make sure that they're praying, you know. And I said, you know, I, I know that before Aunty Jill passed away, she prayed this prayer where she asked Jesus to forgive her of her sins and be born again and, and be her Lord and Saviour. Would you like to pray with me, Uncle Gabriel? And it was the longest pause I've ever had in my entire life. <laughs> he just looked at me like, who is this young nephew of mine trying to, you know? And, and, and I, you know, you're thinking, oh, he's just going to say no. And he thought about it and he goes, might as well. <laughs> it's like, all right, let's do it. So I prayed the sinner's prayer with him. And, you know, for me, that was just such a great joy because, you know, he's been part of my life ever since, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've walked, you know, and, uh, you know, just to see a family member come to Christ is so important, you know, because Carol and I have been praying for all of our family to be saved and we're believing for it, amen? You and your household shall be saved, amen? So don't give up. Don't give up. Keep praying for your family and keep asking the question. Ask for a response. Ask if you can pray with someone. Uh, you never know what fruit you'll bear. So, yeah, so thank you for your prayers. I wanted to mention also tomorrow night there's a men's group here and uh, it's 7 p.m. There's lots of good food. Uh, all the blokes give me a grunt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So come along Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Bring your mates. It'll be good. Uh, apparently there is a Broncos game on as well, but forget about that. We don't need to worry about that horse. We need to worry about the horse that Jesus is coming back on. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. So uh, yeah, come along, blokes, for that. And uh, also wanted to mention on Friday morning, We've got Shane Deegan preaching at the soup kitchen. Now, Shane used to be in our church many years ago, and he's been all around the world doing all sorts of stuff, and he's in town. Uh, so, yeah, it'll be a wild Friday morning, so come along for that. 
And uh, Sunday morning, I'm continuing our series called Imperfect Disciples. Is there any imperfect disciples here? I'm one of them. And uh, we're teaching a series about how Jesus called the disciples to follow him. And then they made disciples who made disciples who made disciples. And that's the way the kingdom expands. Amen. So uh, looking forward to that on Sunday morning. And I uh, just wanted to uh, welcome my good buddy tonight. So Wes and I go way back. Quick story. I was sales manager at a Christian radio station in Brisbane 96.5 years ago. And we had this guy from Crown Financial Ministries come and do a seminar called Business by the Book. And he taught us in that seminar that when you're in business, your purpose is to glorify God. Your function is to make money, but your purpose is to glorify God. And you've got to make sure that you put God first in your business. And at the time, I was just a young sales manager, just married to Carol, and just wanted to make lots of money to keep her happy, basically. (laughs) And uh, I was doing pretty good. I was doing all right. But I started to change my thinking about the way I did my sales at that radio station. And I started praying for my clients. I started witnessing to my clients. I started running alpha courses. And all these clients were getting saved. And uh, because we started putting God first in uh, in our sales, our sales doubled. We went from 400,000 a year to 800,000 to 1.2 million to 1.4 million in four years. Went from three sales staff to six sales staff. Everything just multiplied because we started caring about God first more than our sales. And, uh, you know, isn't that true? When you put God first, the blessings just flow, you know. And uh, so Wes was kind of with me in that season. And then we came, became good buddies over the years. And we, we were part of the founding team for the National Day of Prayer and Fasting, uh, which is coming up on the 27th of this month uh, at Parliament House in uh, Queensland Parliament House, if you want to come. Wes is still on that team, and it's a national movement now. He's a great man of prayer. He's a, a, a mentor to many business people. And he's a great man of God. Please stand to your feet and give a massive welcome for Wes Leak. Woo! Yeah! Thank you, Matt. Ever the evangelist, hey? Though it's been a joy to walk with you over all these years and see how God uses you and uh, uses you to transform many people's lives, which is great. I can't see anyone. Is it? Can we? Can we have some lights? Because they're going to need lights. Because I I am an educationalist, and so that means you're going to be doing some work tonight. It's not going to be just me doing that. So they will need some lights at one stage. Okay, PowerPoints up. So tonight, topic is preparation for revival, letting go of the old for the new to come. How many know that? Uh, It's time to let go of some things. Time to let go of some things and to do that. Uh, Who am I? Just so you know, so this is my wife, Pam, here. We've been married for 28 years now. And uh, this is a family photo that we had last night. So we have four kids, uh, Johanna, Bethany, Sam, and Elijah. And we've got a new ring in. He wants to become part of the family next year. So we're coming into a new stage. It's funny, isn't it? how you go through these different stages as parents. Yes. <laughs> I think, okay, let's go. Uh, so part of what I do is I do lecture in entrepreneurship. We uh, have business blessings on the National Day of Prayer and Fasting. I serve on some other boards and things as well. But uh, tonight my job is to hold space for God to move. Do you know sometimes we've just got to actually quieten ourselves down Because who knows, we don't actually need to pray for the Holy Spirit to come. He's already here. And we sung it tonight in the song, for us to become aware of the presence of God. So one of the things that God has been speaking to me a lot about lately is listening to Him in silence, turning off the radio, turning off the TV, getting the ear pod things out of your ears and just sitting in silence and becoming aware of God's presence. So we're going to be doing that tonight because it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to put into practice and we need to do that. So for the new to come, you have to let go of the old. You've got to let go of the old. And so often God actually calls you to let go of the old first before the new will come. That's scary, isn't it? 
<laughs> to do that. And uh, I've got a picture of a dog there. Because, you know, dogs, you give them a ball, they don't want to let go of it, do they? Unless they want to drop it at your feet for you to throw it again. But sometimes when you give them something or give them a bone, they like what you've got, what they've got. Even though you may bring a new fresh bone with fresh meat, they're happy with what they've got. How many of us are settled with what we've got and are happy with that rather than moving forward? Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, I think it, the older you get, I think it becomes harder. Have you, like, have you noticed that? It's just think, oh, God, not something new again. Um, Isaiah, this is a personal story. Behold, I would do a new thing. So I was at church one Sunday morning. And I was a young whippersnapper. I don't know, 23. I know, that's right. I haven't got many gray hairs, so it's good. Although, all the meetings I'm in now, I look at my friends who have been having meetings with them for ages, and you're seeing all the gray hairs come up. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a new season. Um, so I was sitting in church one Sunday morning, and then this guy gets up to preach, and I had no respect for this preacher. I, he was a guest speaker, you know, pastors who get people up from the congregation to speak, you know. <laughs> But, um, and he's spoken a couple of times, and I, I just never had gelled with him. I'm being very honest here now. Anyhow, he got up and st- he shared this verse. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do not, do you not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And I thought, God, why on earth am I here listening to this man I don't respect and by the way, you don't want to do anything new in my life anyway. Yeah, you shouldn't actually have that conversation with God. Because he said to me, I do want to do a new thing. You see, I had my eye on this girl and we'd been going out and then she broke up with me and I thought, you know, that she had made a mistake and blah, 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 blah. Anyhow, God said, you've got to let go of her. But this wasn't even, it was... Anyhow, so I thought, okay, God, you're saying this. So I did. And I had a wedding to go to that afternoon. And I saw her for the first time in a long time. But, you know, there was nothing there. There was no feelings, no nothing. God had taken it. And it was, yes, it wasn't long after that that God said, this is the one for you. Actually, a funny story. <laughs> I remember we were going up in this church camp. And I'm driving up. And God said to me, you're going to meet your wife this weekend. Wow, you know, so expectation rises, you know. Anyhow, I was driving back down. I thought, oh, well, that didn't happen, did it? But actually it did happen because I had met Pam for the first time that weekend. But there's a, she doesn't like me saying this, but there's a bit of an age gap between the two of us. So I had discounted her straight away for marriage, not for, you know. But we did become friends. There was a group of us who did become friends and, a couple of years later, I was going to a missions trip in the Philippines and I had to stop off Guam, of all places, because I was flying separately and I was flying on frequent flyer points. And uh, while I'm there preparing for the sermons I needed to deliver on the missions trip, God said to me, I want you to marry Pam. I said, God, I'm here to prepare these sermons, not for you to talk about that. Anyhow, there's a long story with that, which ended at that end of that year, me writing a letter to her saying, want to start a relationship with the view of getting married. Because uh, over the next f- three months, I had come to the conclusion that, yes, she was the one for me. The problem was that Pam had absolutely no idea. <laughs> it, um, so we went through that process. But anyhow, we've been married 28 years now. So there you go. Ooh. That's a very short version of that. Yes. Um, there, there's a lot more into that. So we're going to ask, can just take a moment, God, here's a question for you to ask God right now. God, what new thing do you want to do in my life now? I just want you to quiet yourself down, ask God that, and just whatever's the first thing that comes to mind, write it down. Actually, is it on there? Yeah, I'm going to hand out a sheet of paper because there's questions on here. You can write it down. Yeah, Pam's got some. She's a, there's a few questions you're going to ask God about tonight. 
But don't be distracted by all that going on. Just take a moment and ask, God, what new thing do you want to do in these moments? Okay, that's enough time. I'm going to be very quick in this, by the way, because I want you to get to hear the voice of God quickly. Okay? Does anyone want to share what God said to them? God will let us know. We'll let us know. Okay? Somebody else? Peace. He wants to bring peace tonight. That's good. Two more people. Make disciples. He gives you to make disciples. One other person? No. Yes. Go. Go. Okay, so this is one of the things that I want you to get used to doing is when God speaks to you about something, to start to have a conversation with him about that. What does that mean? Okay, God's called me to go. God, what does that look like? Go where? Is it go to another nation? Is it go to a person? Is it, and have a conversation with him about it. Okay, I'm going to look at, when we talk about revival, I'm going to look at a very different passage tonight. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 3 to 7. And it's actually in relation to the reign of Josiah. Now, I didn't know if you know Kings, and I'm actually going to encourage you to read through 2 Kings 22 and 23. We're not going to have time to go through that tonight fully, but I'd love for you to sit with those two passages. So if um, Josiah was one of the youngest kings that was appointed. He was eight years old. Can you imagine that? Like we've just seen the one of the oldest kings coronated. Haven't we coronated? Is that the word? Crowned, <laughs> crowned on uh, Saturday. Um, but yet this is a story of one of the youngest kings. So he was crowned at eight years old. So, but now we're now 10 years later into his reign. And it says in the 18th year of his reign, sorry, 18 years later, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azalia, the son of Meshulam to the temple of the Lord, he said, go up to Hikiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that is being brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work of the temple, and have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord, the carpenters, the builders, and the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dress stone to repair the temple." but they need not to account for the money entrusted to them because they were honest in their dealings. So what had been going on here? People had been going to the temple and paying their temple tax, but they hadn't been using the money for what it was intended for it to be used for. The temple was in ruins. So Josiah said to them, it's time for you to use the money for what it's been intended for. But it's very interesting. God, why did you start with getting money right first? Often we don't look at that. But in this case, the priests had to use the money for what it was intended for. So tonight, later on, I'm just planting some seeds now. Are you using your money for what God intended it for? And I'm not just talking about giving here, okay? This is not a message about giving. This is, are you using the money God's entrusted to you for what he intended it for? These guys weren't. They weren't doing that. And so the king held them to account. What's fascinating to me, it was somebody outside of the church that held the church to account. 
And we're seeing that a bit lately, aren't we? That the world is starting to hold the church to account and say, hey, church, you're collecting all this money, but what are you doing with it? Are you using it for the purpose that God intended it to be? And this was a biblical case of this happening. So let's go on to 2 Kings 20, the next couple of verses, verses 8 to 10. Hikiah the high priest said to Shaphanah the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphanah. I hope I get these words right. Who read it? Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphanah, the secretary, informed the king, Hikai the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it from it in the presence of the king. The book of the law had been hidden. They hadn't been able to find it. But when they got the money right and they used the money for how God had meant it to be used, they got the revelation from the Father. Think about that. They got the revelation from God when they set their money in order. What revelation does God want to release to you when you get the money in order and use it for how it's meant to be. It's interesting that they said about the people that the money was given to, that they were entrusted to them because they were honest in their dealings and they did not have to give an account for how they spent the money. Goes totally against all accounting principles today. When you're in a workplace, what do you spend money? What have you got to do? Get a receipt, show it, prove it. These guys were so trustworthy that they didn't have to do that. Can we say that of Christians today? Can we say that? That they got revelation. Let's look at what happened. When they got the money right, they got fresh revelation. Let's have a look about what the revelation led to. It led to them inquiring of the Lord. They found the book of the Lord, and so they went to the prophet and said, is this from God? And it came back, yes. They read the book of the law in public. All the people, all the people of the land heard the word of the Lord. And they actually made a fresh covenant with God as a result. Then the cleanup started. They removed all the temple, the items that should have not been there. All sorts of stuff. They cleaned it out. They removed the adulterous priests. The removal of other worship items. They had male prostitutes in the temple that were removed. They removed the stuff from the high places. They stopped the sacrifice of children to Moloch. They pulled down the other altars that were there. There was all sorts of different things around the country that they pulled down. Well, this, should, this should be celebrated the Passover, not the Passover. Sorry, autocorrect. They started re-celebrating the feasts and festivals that God had um, ordained. They removed the mediums, the spiritists, the household gods, idols, and detestable things. What was interesting that it started in the temple, and it started from them getting the money right. Then they got the fresh revelation. Then God started talking to them, hey, we've got to get all these different things right and in order. But then it affected the nation. It affected the nation. It starts with us. It starts with us. It starts with us. And it starts with us getting our money right. You know, of Josiah it was said, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with the law of Moses. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of us, that we are people 
he turned to the Lord as Josiah did. So we're going to talk about five things that perhaps we need to get cleaned up. The first one is forgiveness. Who do you need to forgive? Actually, I should just list these and I'm going to go, I've got slides for each one. So there's forgiveness, inner healing, repentance, deliverance, and then we're going to do some truth therapy tonight. So repentance, uh, forgiveness. Who do you need to forgive? Which person do you need to forgive? You know, I've started doing this thing called a Questioning God Week, and I had all these 75 and 80-year-olds on this call. And um, one of the ladies on the first night, we just broke, she couldn't speak. She just was bawling her eyes out. And then a week later, when we did some follow-up with her, she was so embarrassed by it. But anyhow, I said, well, what did God speak to you about? She said, I had to forgive my parents. I said, so that's when I asked her how old she was. And she said she was 80. And this happened when she was 10. She'd been carrying stuff for 70 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. Do you need to forgive God? Okay. When I was doing some of this um, asking, I was asking God the question, God, what lie do I believe about you? And he said to me, you believe that I leave you hanging. <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know when God speaks to you and you think, what the heck? You know, as my wife would test and Matt would test, there's been some very crazy things that God's had me do over the years, fly to other nations for a weekend to meet strange people. And, but all sorts of things come to mind. And I said to God, well, then what's the truth? If I believe that, you leave me hanging. He said, actually, you're standing on solid ground. That when you listen to me and obey me, you're actually standing on solid ground. Do you need to forgive an institution? Do you need to forgive the government? Is there somebody else? So we're going to take time. On your sheet now, I'm going to ask you, God, who do I need to forgive? So whatever name comes or institution comes, just write it down. Don't question it, just write it down. Does anyone want to share who God said? You don't. Um, there's a reason why I, I ask this question. It's not because I want to pry into your life. It's because we hear the voice of God in community. We hear the voice of God in community. So when someone says something, it actually often confirms, oh, I did hear from God. Yeah. Or it may also spark something. Huh. I need to forgive that person too. 
Did you say any? James? Queensland government? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is one of the things when we open ourselves up to God, we often don't know that we're harboring these things. Does anyone else want to share? Forgive yourself. Was there anything particular he said to you about that? Yeah. Yeah. Queensland government, he sacked him. The church and the government. Okay. So you realize that when you ask for the forgiveness of the yes, forgive yourself. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you would empower this forgiveness. Father, as we bring these people or organizations or institutions to you, Father, we ask for forgiveness. Father, and thank you for that cleansing to come. Lord, for some, it's like Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Lord, for others, they did know what they were doing. And Lord, even so, we still forgive them. In Jesus' name, Lord, empower this forgiveness. And Lord, I pray that you would set people free as a result. Lord, that they'll be able to move forward and leave the past behind. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, um, I've been reading a book called um, Crash Landing, which is actually the, uh, it's just a new book that's come out. Um, it's a story of what happened in the U.S. at the start of the pandemic and all the meetings that went on behind the scenes with some of the top companies. You know what really struck me was that a number of the CEOs, like six months before, had started to get a sense that something was not right and had started preparing their companies for something major. They just didn't know what it was. And I thought, God, that's very interesting. You started preparing them in advance. But these people weren't saved, but God had been preparing them and getting their things. But um, but then when it came time to negotiating with the government in terms of the payouts and things that they were going to receive, they were crunching numbers, and the numbers that came up were huge. Like the airline industry asked for $50 billion, for example. And just God was speaking to me. He says, in seasons of the extraordinary it's time to ask for extraordinary things. In seasons of the extraordinary. We're in an extraordinary season at the moment. I know. Really strange things happen. It's time to ask God for the extraordinary. To go after. And not to be afraid to ask for the big things. To go after it. You know, to see. Yeah. I've just been reminiscing on that today. Yes, this stuff. Yes, I've been sacked. But okay, God. But that's that's small. Like, God, what's next? You know, what's next? I'm asking for bigger things. Um, in doing that, yeah. So just put that there. Okay. So forgiveness. Inner healing. Dealing with hurts from the past. Just to take time to ask God, is there stuff in the past that I need to deal with? Is there stuff that you want? 
to heal a lot of the changes. <laughs> so I, I'm not going to do anything in relation to that tonight, but I'm flagging it with you. It's okay. Like we all carry stuff. Stuff happens all the time. The next one is repentance. Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know me. 1 John 1, verse 19, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If, um, James 5, 16, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I, was, uh, I had this long, like a five-hour conversation with this young guy the other day. And he said to me, Wes, why don't we confess our sins to one another? There is actually, uh, like I've, I've had a couple of situations lately where this has happened. And I think we need to be prepared for this to happen more. That because, I mean, that's a very powerful promise that when we confess our sins to one another so we can pray for one another so that you may be healed. I would suggest you choose carefully who you confess your sin to, just a very practical thing. But on the other side of the coin is... You know, sometimes we throw the baby out with the bark order because we see other denominations who have made a big thing of this. Like you think of the Catholic Church and confessional and stuff like that. But the actual thing is that what they do is biblical. It's like that confession to someone is actually a biblical thing to do, but we've, we've thrown it out. We've done that. You know, if you... Um, you know, in Catholic churches and Anglican churches, United Church churches, their communion service is built around asking for forgiveness of sins and preparing for communion. Whereas, and I'm not putting the church down, you know, we do communion in three seconds flat compared to a whole service. There is actually something in that. And it was something that actually struck me watching the coronation like, it, it led up to them taking communion. Mm. Like, what other political figure, when they're inaugurated, do they take communion? Who knows what that does? You know, we know. It's very powerful doing that. So, I'm just planting that seed with you tonight. Do you need to... You know, I, over the years, I've led different sessions where... We've just asked God, and I think it's actually on your sheet too, isn't it? There's a question about what do you need to ask God. Yes. So we're going to take a time to do that. It just be prepared for something that you don't normally think about. A couple of times when I've done this with groups of business people, like some of the things that God's asked them to repent of is not what you would have normally thought. Like James before, when he talked about the people who own the boarding houses. You know, so let's just take a moment.
know this is brave, but does anyone want to share what God spoke to them about? This might be a big one, but I had this feeling today that we can be brought up in, like I was brought up in the exclusive brethren. I mean, you might have been brought up Catholic, but deep down we have this pride about that. And I just think, you know, it just, you think you've gotten rid of everything, but it's deep down, there's a pride there, the way the church I was brought up in. Yeah. I know because I was brought up AOG, and I remember when I got to uni, because I always thought that Catholics were sinners going to hell, and the SDAs were kind of. We all are. Well, I, 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 I'm confessing why the SDAs were just really out there. And then I started to mingle with Catholics and Anglicans, and, and I realized that actually it was my attitude. That was wrong, and I had to repent of it. It was actually quite funny at the Jesus Revolution movie. I bumped into one of the girls who was an SDA that was in my cell group at uni who I had to change my attitude about. James, are you going to say something? It's amazing how you just, I think you mentioned. Um, I. I'd forgiven individuals in my religious background, which was Catholic and Catholic school, but I'd never forgiven um, the entity. Yeah. Like, you know, for the first time tonight, I've heard of entities like Queensland State Government. Like, um, I mean, they should be held to account. I'm not saying they're not. But in my own heart, I've got to forgive and... Uh, even, even some personal things like uh, workaholicism. <laughs> you know, old I, Protestant I'm on the go too much. Yeah. And uh, however, the only time I do quieten down is when I'm with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Listening to his voice. Okay. The next one is deliverance and... I mean, we're not going to do any deliverance here tonight, but, you you know, God's been doing some stuff in this church around that as well. And um, a, uh, one of my friends from Port Macquarie phoned me the other day and he said they're, they're training up 100 people to do deliverance in that area, which was just fantastic. It does. So he got me to read a book which arrived today and my wife says, hmm, somebody... Another book just arrived. <laughs> but it was interesting because I was reading it and I'm thinking, oh, oh, heck. You know, just be aware of what God may want to expose in your own life. Um, and there's nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed. Like it's actually, you know, all this stuff is actually an invitation from God. He's not there to berate you. He's not this big ogre in the sky who's ready to you know, slap you around the face again and say, ah, you got it wrong again, da, da, da. No, it's, it came, like, part of this came for me at the end of, it was not last year, the year before, someone actually said to me, get behind me, Satan. And it was, it was very hurtful at the time because I was trying to have an open conversation with him about something that was very difficult that was happening. Anyhow, it caused me to actually go back and look at that passage. And if you look at it, Jesus didn't do that in public. He pulled Peter aside. And it was actually a very loving conversation with him, saying, hey, mate, you've just got to change your thinking here a bit because I've got other things to do, not what you want to do. And it, like, it was a loving thing. And I thought, oh, God, that's who you are. You are a loving God. You, you're saying these things to us tonight 
as an invitation to say, I want to improve our relationship. I want to go deeper. And I want to use you. But there's some stuff that's hindering this to move forward. So, yeah, I can't say that. So tonight we're going to do some truth therapy. So it's re replacing the lies of the enemy with the truth of God. Because how do you know? Who knows? The enemy is the father of lies, isn't he? And he does his job very well. Have you noticed that? But we accept the lie. And we walk in that lie. And it hinders us. So tonight I've got some questions for you about the area of money. So I'm going to give you five minutes or so. I know it's not long, but I just, I want you to get used to hearing the first thing that comes to your mind and writing it down without editing it. Because we're in a season where we need to learn to hear God quickly. Is that right? Because we're in situations, you're talking to someone and you start to hear this little whisper of God and you think, oh, that can't be God. You know, <laughs> I can remember I was in Argentina, walking down the street, and we was trying to buy presents for the kids coming home. And I, at this um, jewelry stand thing, and God started speaking to me. He said, you need to prophesy over the owner of the thing. Don't be stupid. It's like, I don't speak Spanish, you know, and the, anyhow, I walked on. And uh, I said to the person, the people who were with me, I said, oh, we've got to go back. And they said, why? And I said, I need to prophesy over so I had to talk to the lady who spoke Spanish and look it was something very simple just that God loves you he knows your situation and he cares for you and then we found out what was going on her husband had had a heart attack and was in hospital and while that was going on the daughter came in and told her that she was pregnant out of wedlock and so her cry was God you don't care for me do you and then she said, and God's brought someone from Australia to hear me, to tell me that he loves me. And I thought, what if I hadn't have gone back? Who knows? Like, you know, you don't have to have this 10-minute prophetic word. It could be one word. It may be a smile. It may be something practical. It may be buying something from somebody or doing something. You don't know what they've been praying for. Uh, I do this listening prayer thing on Wednesday mornings, and this morning we, we sat with the blind Bartimaeus passage. And <laughs> I'm glad I keep a box of tissues on my desk because I went through a couple this morning. Um, what's interesting about that passage is that he was calling out. To Jesus. But those that should have known better were saying, shut up, shut up. Some of you have Christian people in your life telling you to shut up. But do you know what happened? Jesus called out his name. He said, come to me. He got up. He threw off his cloak and went to him. Oh, tissues, thank you. <laughs> Just in case. Jesus asked him this question. What do you want me to do for you? What a loving question. God could be asking you the same thing. So we asked that. We asked that of God this morning. And what God showed people was just amazing. What he, he really touched some very deep things in people's hearts. Stuff that they'd been crying out for a long time. You know, they, they, their kids would have kids. You know, that's a very deep thing. There's some other things that God showed. And I just thought, Jesus is standing here tonight and he's saying to you, what do you want from me? So let's just sit for 10 minutes. That question's not on here. You might want to write it in here. But this is what I'm going to get you to do. There's some questions here. God, what's on your heart for me today? Those who have read through chairs will know that's a question that we ask. Is there anything new? I want you to write down, God, what is actually on your heart for me? 
yeah, on, yeah, page one on the Bronga. Then over the pages, let's have some real conversations. God, what lies do I believe about money? What lies do I believe about money? And then you're going to replace that. Then you're going to ask God, but God, what is the truth about money? And then you're going to do this thing, I let go of the lie that. So whatever lie God tells you that you believe about money, you're going to write down, I let go of the lie that I don't have enough. I let go of the lie that I need to have blah, 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 blah. Whatever, whatever it is God speaks to you about. And then, God, what is the truth about money? Then I receive, and write down, I receive the truth that. Okay? We're doing a divine exchange there. Okay. Speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Okay, I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to go through that. I'm just going to give you another minute.
Is that Pastor Chris? He's not in the toilet, is he? <laughs> you know, you've heard these um, stories of when speakers have all got, you know, all the been all mic'd up and then they go to the loo and then they hear everything in the toilet being broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so does someone want to share what God spoke to them about? I, yeah. Let's say, what lie do you believe about money? That God can't provide for you without money. So what's the truth? God can't provide for you today without money. So you need to have money for God to provide. So what's the truth? Yes, he provides the money in the first place. Yeah, faith in all areas of our life. It's good. Okay, who else would like to share? Did you want it? No? Kelly? Yeah. Did you need more? Don't have enough. God will provide. So that's the truth that God will provide? Right, okay. So what's the truth? He will provide. Yeah. Hey, your singing voice is very good, Pastor Chris. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, it was funny. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. They, that's what they all say. Yes. Is it good? Okay, yes. 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 So what's the truth? <coughs> so did you eat today? Hello? I heard that from a pastor, and thinking that, okay, it's got to, you got to believe that, knowing, you know, and and I hear so many testimonies at, uh, from other people that are suffering, you know, and 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 sometimes, well, I can speak for myself. Sometimes I do take things for granted. And, and, and I realize 
actually tonight, like, I think that's one of the reasons why I don't forgive myself, because we have everything at our, at our fingertips, knowing that um, God has provided for us. But we, but we don't... I think it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't sink into our hearts, knowing that he has already provided. You know, and um, I know for myself, and I'm just going to be bold and open here, but I, 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 I haven't really, there's been days where I haven't really thanked God for whatever I have. And then again, I, I look at, there's been times where I've got things now that I never thought I have. And I look, you know, and, and, he, and God has gone beyond, and like the words here, he's gone beyond, <clears throat> beyond um, giving. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah, so, so uh, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, when, when, when you do get the revelation of, of what God does provide, and it doesn't always have to be through finance or money, yeah. you know. It can be through, uh, you know, it could be through clothing. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not going to break here, but I, you know, a lady wanted a sticker from a shop. And, uh, and the owner said, oh, we have, if you're going to use your card, you've got to have to use $5 minimum on your card. <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I blessed this this lady. It was only fifty cents, like. And again, I'm not bragging, but I did it to a gentleman too. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, obviously at that time, I had the money. And I I, I believe not only I blessed the person, but but the money was there for me yeah. to bless that person. Yeah. See, you make a very good point that it's, like, we always think that money is the answer. It's not necessarily. God provides in all sorts of ways, doesn't he? And it could it could come, like, when I was in England, what's said, um, I couldn't access the money because it was a check account, and I couldn't access our check account on the ATM over in the U.S. So, but I'm, I'm in church the morning, I need to catch a train afterwards. That God said, empty all the money out of your wallet. The God that you know I've got to catch the train to another city. And uh, he just said, you've got to do this. But, you know, that's just, that's tough. Anyhow, I did. And uh, the couple I was staying with took me to the train. And he just shot out of the car, ran ahead, and purchased the ticket for me. Like, I hadn't told him anything about that but he purchased a ticket and then the next day went to the bank and was able to sort it out and access the cash i just thought um you know i was sharing with the guys this morning we had a time where a contract was delayed and um I said to pam this day what do we need and she said i just we just need a loaf of bread like we'd got down we just needed a loaf of bread and so we prayed and we both had to go pick up kids that came home there was a loaf of bread sitting on our doorstep. Do you know, it came from our neighbor who worked for Tip Top. And he'd been our neighbor for a long time, but had never given us a loaf of bread. But do you know, he did that more regularly after that. We didn't ask him. Like, but I just remember coming home, there was a loaf of bread on the thing. You just, you just, you know. But then the other side of the coin, um, going back at the beginning of, when do we move? 2021. At the beginning of 2021, God said to me, you need to start saving more than what you're doing. You know, so we, I was much more intentional about saving money. Then at the end of um, that year, God moved us. Which, what's going on? Don't lose it. Um, God moved us within 10 days. But because we had money in the bank, like I was able to pay for the the bond and pay for the first month's rent and pay for... You know, all that. But that was not on our radar. But God had said, you start saving. You know, so that's the thing is to start to have a conversation with God about your money. 
what is this? What is it? Because he knows what's coming up ahead. You know, and this is, this is what struck me about these CEOs. They had this sense that something was coming and that they needed to prepare their companies for it. They had no idea what it was. It, uh, even um, Bob Bodine, who wrote Two Chairs, three weeks prior to the pandemic, because he's in sports, his whole business shut down. So three weeks prior, God had said to him, start up a new company. He didn't even know what it was. And then during the pandemic, all these people came to him and said, we've got to do this, this, and this. But because he had the other company set up, he was positioned to do that. So, you know, sometimes God starts speaking to you about these things, and you're thinking, what the heck? But see, it's obedience. And this is one of the ways that you learn to hear the voice of God is in your money, in doing that. But there's obviously a bigger picture because we, you know, in the passage today, in Second Kings, like what a strange passage to talk about. There was, God brought it to me a couple of weeks ago. I'm thinking, man, they had to get the money in the church right first. We have to get our money right first and then go for that. And it's not just about giving. Yes, giving is part of it. But talk to God about your giving too. Talk to him about where do you want me to give this money? How much do you want me to give? You know, when it comes each week, you know, just like I know as an accountant, we like, you know, churches to set up direct debits and, you know, the money and Pastor Matt wants that to happen too, which is good. And I <laughs> but you wonder how much more God wants to do. Are we limiting God in doing that? Is there more? And it's not just about the ability to give. It's like what is, like, we live in a very nice apartment, you know, which God, but, you know, in the move, um, so the story is we left home, okay? So we left the kids behind in our house, two of them behind, and then we rent out four other rooms. But the income from all that covers our rent and gives us extra. And, like, God spoke to us, says, you need to move. And we just thought, you know, with the rental crisis and everything, we just thought we'd go out for one day and have a look. So there were seven different places we went to and looked and said, oh, my, so there's some really bad stuff out there, as you guys know, in doing that. And, um, and so our son, Eli, who was 11 at the time, him and I liked one apartment, and my wife liked another apartment. Does that happen to anyone else? Or is it just, yeah. So we, um, we hadn't rented in 23 years, so we had to put the application in couldn't believe how much, but you guys didn't know how much. There, anyhow, we ended up getting accepted for both apartments, which I thought I thought we were in a rental crisis, but uh, and like like we were competing against doctors and like, you know, I'm thinking, what the heck is going on? And then so we went back. Parents said we've got to go back and see these two before we accept them, you know. And my prayer that morning was, God, just make it clear which one we're to go to. And we went separately, and Pam got stuck in the first apartment that she wanted because it was the issue, issue was it was furnished and, you know, she didn't want to have to buy new furniture. And because we didn't know whether we'd like apartment living, and there's all sorts of other reasons for it. And when I arrived there, she said, No, we're not living here. I said, Well, do you want to talk to me about this? But God had made it very clear that that wasn't the place for us. So we said to the other place. Do you know, of course, the floods came a couple of months later. And that building was knocked out of action for six months. Like, if we had have chosen that, imagine the, like, you know, move. So, anyhow, we were in the apartment. About three weeks later, the alarm goes off at 3 o'clock in the morning, like the fire alarm. Because one of the things in the move, we had to get rid of a lot of stuff. Like, downsize, just clear stuff off. And the alarm, you know, fire alarm went off. And I thought, chances are it's not real. But what if it is real? What would I take? And I thought, actually, all I need is my phone and my laptop because it has key stuff on there. Um, but it was like God saying, I've removed the attachment to stuff from your life, which is really where I think God is taking us. We need to be nimble and ready to move. So like, we don't have to buy stuff anymore. Like, like when it comes to birthdays and things, well, I don't need anything. Like, you know, it's, um, yeah. Anyhow, I've gone over time. Can I pray for you? Do you want to stand? I think, has God spoken to you individually tonight?
You think there's going to be some change after tonight? <laughs> Why don't you put out your hands to receive? Father, we just received truth tonight. Thank you that you're doing a divine exchange. We hand to you the lies. We hand to you the lies. Father, we receive the truth, not just in the area of money, but in all aspects of our lives. Father, I pray that you would expose the lies of the enemy that he's spoken to us about over the years that we're believing and that we would instead receive the truth, the truth that sets us free. And Father, as, as, as you enable our own houses to get in order, Lord, that the church would get in order. Lord, that we would see the stuff that's not of you in our country go. Lord, that the high places be torn down. The, the sacrifice of children be gone. The male prostitutes be gone. Lord, you have done it before. You can do it again, but it starts with us. Lord, as we prepare, Lord, help us to let go of the old, the stuff that we're attached to. Thank you that even the demons are fleeing right now. The stuff that's been attached to us is gone. Thank you for a fresh and filling of the Holy Spirit. Sweep over this place. Sweep over everybody's life. Thank you for the freedom. Thank you for the awareness of your presence. Lord, if there's stuff in our homes that's not of you, I pray that you'd expose it. Lord, as they go home, to remove the idols, remove the stuff. There's stuff that needs to be smashed or burned or whatever that you would point it out. Lord, that cleansing would come. I declare you healed in Jesus' name as you confess your sins to each other tonight. For he is faithful and just and has forgiven you and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And in Jesus' name you're healed. Amen. Well, we should open up the altar afterwards like we can close the meeting, but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, if you want some prayer, come to the altar. Uh, let me tell you, Wes is a mighty man of prayer, and I believe when someone brings a word, they've got an anointing uh, to minister to people as well. So if something spoke to you tonight and you wanted some prayer, maybe you need healing in your body, uh, maybe you need, uh, maybe you're far from God and you want to come back to God tonight, you want to recommit yourself to Him, come to the altar. Uh, we'd love to pray for you tonight uh, as we close the service. God bless. Thank you so much.